The more I look at this painting, which of course I haven't seen, as hardly anybody has for the last 40 years, the more complicated and the better it gets. Is Dyer looking in, or is he a reflection in the mirror? I don't know, it's extraordinary. The Pope and Dyer have been confronting one another privately for almost half a century. This is Francis Bacon's Study of Red Pope, 1962, second version, 1971. The painting was first unveiled at the Grand Palais in October 1971, was then moved to the Dusseldorf retrospective in 1972, and the family of the present owner bought the work in February 1973. It hasn't been seen since. It is a painting that is really the grand but tragic finale to Bacon's famous series of popes. But it's the only one that unites the Pope with his other great muse, George Dyer. Bacon had been interested in images of the Pope, and in particular Velasquez painting, since the late 1940s. The more one looks, the more odd it is. Here we have the Pope and an East End gangster. He sets up this situation and then finds some way of occupying it, which is theatrical, dramatic, and at its best, hugely exciting. George Dyer looks almost as if he's judging the Pope. Who is the most powerful being in the world? Or is it a kind of confession? Is it our audience with the painting or the Pope's with an East End criminal? Bacon's painting process is extremely complicated. For a start, he would have the canvas stretched up back to front so that the primed side is on the reverse and he's painting on the rear of the linen. Bits of thick scumbling and sort of almost abstract expressionist swerving. But Bacon also knows exactly when to stop. So the painting is full of emptiness and silences. You have these wonderful centrifugal forces working, bringing the two aspects together and driving your head to their two faces so that you become a part of the painting with them. And you have this wonderful situation where there's the naked canvas, there's the drawn lines, and it gradually gets more and more complex. The Pope is all movement. George Dyer is standing there on the threshold. And yet there is always a feeling with blurring, which Bacon used a lot, that there is someone who is not a sculpture, but a living being. The painting was really an epiphany for him and in many ways could be seen to be a prophecy as well. In October 1971, 36 hours before the opening of this Grand Palais exhibition, probably Bacon's finest hour as an artist, his great love and the other great muse of his career, George Dyer, was found dead in their hotel room having committed suicide. I think as the years went by, the tragedy of the story that would only unwind after this painting was made prompts this incredible series of the black triptychs that he made in memory of George Dyer. It is, of course, a kind of conversation on many different levels, both between Dyer and the Pope, between Bacon and a whole series of paintings, which lead us inevitably back to Diego Velázquez. It's a dialogue with Bacon's own ambition. In the end, I find it a confrontation between the hysterical and the deadpan. And the fact that Bacon can hold those two things together is like a bomb and it's something that very few artists can pull off.